John Dryden of Zalem and a Chitofel. Holy times, priests, yet to exercise power over people by cunning means. Not thought sinful, more than one wife. Free to beget children by cohabiting with many women. Men acted with natural desires, urges. Not forbidden by any law to have unrestrained sexual relationships with many wives and mistresses. King of Israel, London, Charles II. Contracted sexual relationships with wives, slaves, many children. Wife, Catherine of Braganzo, a piece of unfertile land with no crops. Illegitimate children, mistresses, slaves, no legal heirs. Duke of Monmouth, Absalom, handsomest, bravest. Forced by a more sacred passion. Earn fame by his gallantry. Feelings of brotherhood. Married to a charming bride and Scott, Countess of Piclou. Faults ignored, surplus energy of youth, a healthy outlet. No adversity, England, violently. Self will slash moody slash grumbling. Unlimited grace of God. Adam, same mistake. King in exile, the Netherlands. No more civil wars. Death of Oliver Cromwell. Foolish son, Richard Cromwell. Forced to resign the office of the Lord Protector of England. Inhabitants of the old city of London. Roman Catholic by faith. But Protestants became stronger. Wrong, incorrect. Images of deities burned like common wood. Priests raged with fury. Hatching of a conspiracy, the Popish plot. Allegations believed, disbelieved entirely. Catholics, one tenth of Protestants. Fraudery, favorite method. Rebels pardoned by King, Sheikh Mujib. A Chitofel. Earl of Shaftesbury. The foremost traitor among them. Even cursed by posterity. Fitted for secret intrigues and underhand methods. Intelligent slash fearless slash of a stormy nature. Restless, unable to stick to any office, principle. Unlimited lust for power. Intolerant of any blow to dignity. An over-energetic mind but undermined made him less confident, less powerful or less likely to succeed, or to make him weaker, often gradually an already weak body. Fearless leader in times of danger. Happy with dangers, two friends in my village. Great thinkers, philosophers like madmen. Hardly distinguished. Weak body, why hard work? Amassed with wealth, why no rest? Why hard earn wealth to that two-legged creature without feathers namely his son who is so deformed? An absurd mass of flesh, drama, beauty, law, rule. Treacherous in friendship. Merciless in hatred. High authority ought to wreck the country. Violated the Triple Alliance. Between England slash Sweden slash Holland. By instigating war against the Netherlands. Peace broken, slavery of England. By a secret treaty with France. Patriot, pretends, sent before death to neutralize. Traitors, indeed safe. Evil doers respected by sinful, corrupt. Wicked, degraded people shut their eyes to treason, wickedness. We hate Shaftesbury the politician. But admire Shaftesbury the judge. David, a song in praise of Shaftesbury, God. Reckless in ambition, wants no stability. Wanted to multiply his gains without limit. Crimes disclosed, boldly defied the king's authority, second affair in the Slyonless court. Took the side of Catholics hatching against the king. Circulating rumors to prove King Charles a Roman Catholic. English, fickle minded, change like the moon, full, feeble. To change monarch, twenty years. Lunar cycle, nineteen years. Found a leader, a chit so full. Politicians neither love nor hate anybody. Eulogized the following Love, failed, dash frock slash snake, dash rabindranath, power transferred, dash angle slash lost dash pigeons, tamed. Lines 230, 261. You were lucky by birth, O oh Prince. Some highly favorable star was in the ascendant in the southern sky when you were born. You are greatly loved by the people of this country who have a strong desire that you should rule them. 
they treat you with the same respect as was shown by the Israelites towards the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire by which they were guided in the course of their journey through the wilderness. These people look upon you as a divine leader just as the Israelites looked upon Moses who, by the flourish of his rod, worked the miracle of dividing the ocean and showing to his followers the land which God promised to give them in order to enable them to settle there and start a new life. Holy prophets of every distant and bygone age were prompted by a divine inspiration to prophesy your birth. You represent the fulfillment of the prayers of the people. You have been the subject of talk of astrologers who felt happy to foresee this day. You are a personification of the desire of young men and an embodiment of the dream of old men. You will prove to the savior of the nation, and the nation swears its support and allegiance to you. The nation is always desirous of seeing you. The more they see you the more they want to see you. They invoke God's favor on you. Wherever you go, processions are formed promptly and without any previous notice to welcome you and to announce your arrival. Infants who are learning to speak are taught to pronounce your name, because your name is on everybody's lips. How long will you make the people wait for you to become their king and how long must they wait to celebrate that occasion? How long will you make them wait hungrily for the benefits of your reign and how long will you deprive them of that pleasure? It seems that you are, content to pass your days in a state of obscurity like of one of those fools who follow the path of virtue and who feel happy because they are being praised. You will pass your days thus filled till the new honors, which you have won and which make you so attractive now, lose their glitter and become stale and dim by being seen daily. Believe me, young prince, you must pluck the fruit now when it is ripe because, if you do not, it will rot upon the tree and become useless. You must strike when the iron is hot, or you will feel sorry at having lost the opportunity. Heaven has so ordained that every human being gets, sooner or later, an opportunity which can bring about a lucky transformation in his life. The good of human beings depends upon their own will. Therefore, if we are vigilant and if we make skillful use of the opportunities which fate offers us, no hurdles will obstruct the progress of our careers and we shall continue to rise upwards. Once fortune begins to favor us, it will continue its favorable trend. But, if we do not utilize our opportunities, our luck will slip away, and disappear like the wind, leaving us to repent our folly. In your case, fortune is now ready to offer you a glorious prize. You can now catch hold of fortune by her four locks. If you miss, she will flee and you will not be able to catch her. Lines 262, 302 If old Charles, who begot you, had not shown the courage to accept the offer of fortune to make him king, he would still have remained in exile in Brussels, and the holy oil, with which he was anointed when he was crowned as the king, would have been useless in his case. You should base your hopes on the success achieved by him in his youthful days, but you should not follow his example now when he has grown old and lost his energies. See how he is losing his radiance like the sun setting in the western sky, and see how his influence is waning just as the light of the sun diminishes as it sets. He is not the same Charles now as he was when he landed on Dover Beach where the English people had joyfully gathered to welcome him in such large numbers that the seashore itself was rendered completely invisible, being covered fully with multitudes of human beings. Now his power and authority are declining and he may be compared to Lucifer who, after falling from divine grace, was expelled from heavenly regions and thus lost much of his splendor. The Popish plot, by no means very powerful, but the only redeeming feature of the cursed regime of Charles, has served to expose him to the scorn of the people. The large numbers of people who unitedly stood behind the king have been dispersed and scattered by the disruptive effect of that one weak plot. Deserted by friends, and wholly surrounded by enemies, he hardly has the strength to oppose your designs. If he makes use of the help of the French king, Louis XIV, of whose support he cannot be sure, the English Protestants would feel even more annoyed with him for invoking help from a foreign quarter. France, which is proud of its power, would offer only a faint friendship to him. France would encourage civil war in England but would not support Charles. Nor would the supporters of the king unite with the French army to help the Roman Catholics in England. Or, if they do so, their strength would soon crumble, and the authority of Charles would be weakened because of the help being given to him by an ally who is hated here. I have employed such successful methods that all sorts of people have developed a hatred for monarchy and no longer feel any respect or love for Charles's rule. There is now a general and forceful demand for the upholding of religion, commonwealth, and liberty. If you, who have royal blood in veins, come forward as a champion of the public good and strengthen the people by becoming their leader, England can have great hopes for the future, and the leader, that is, you, will gain general acclaim by supporting the public cause.
you will not only earn people's praise which in itself is meaningless and therefore comparable to a showy flower pleasing only to the sense of sight, but you will acquire solid authority. And even limited authority, gained through the love of the people of your native land, is a nobler achievement than kinship gained through succession to the throne by virtue of a legal claim derived from a long and ancient ancestry, or, derived from an ancestry which goes as far back to the past as Noah's Ark mentioned in the Bible. Flattery, Soothing Effect Ambition, Blinding Effect Desire, Originated in Heaven, Divine Source Absalom Ambitious Young Man Excessive desire for fame, reputation, Lucifer's nature. Unwittingly led away from the path. Intoxicated by glowing tributes. Corrupted by too much praise. Half willing, half unwilling because of loyalty towards the king. Replies the following. Lines 316, 372. And what excuse do I have to start a fight in defense of the freedom of the people? My father governs the kingdom with an undisputed right. He is the defender of the faith, or the religion of people, and he is a source of joy to all mankind. He is noble, generous and just, and he obeys and enforces the laws of the land. By wonderfully supporting his cause, God made him the king. Is there anyone to whom he has done any injustice during his entire rule which has been an era of peace? Is there anyone who has pleaded for justice before his throne and been denied justice? Has he not pardoned those numberless enemies who incurred his wrath by opposing him and whom he should have punished for that opposition? He is gentle, lenient, or easily accessible, humble, and always striving for the public good. He has a merciful nature, and has a dislike for bloodshed. If it is a fault in him that he is gentle in dealing with his obstinate subjects, his fault is one from which God himself is not free and one which makes people love God. What can he gain by betraying his people and what can he gain by giving up his right to rule his people and accepting the arbitrary rule of the French king? Let the arrogant French king dam his fertile land, irrigated by the river Nile, with his arbitrary rule, and let him tyrannize over his slavish people. If the people of London displeased with King Charles's rule, it means that their brains have been heated by the dog star Sirius and that they are therefore not in their right minds. Why then should I encourage the wicked elements in the state by revolting against the king and run madly after the people, or try like a madman to gain the applause of the people, or act madly in the manner of the common people? If the king had been a ruthless dictator and if he had, by exercising power in an illegal manner, persecuted the Protestants and given undue concessions to the Catholics, I would have been justified in deploring that state of affairs, but even then my natural filial feelings towards him would have restrained my mind and checked me from making any move against him. The people might have demanded their freedom, and they would have been right. But the same demand from me would have been a crime, because I, being his son, must not revolt against him. He is so kind to me that he has supplied all my wants. He meets my needs before those needs are felt by me, and fulfills my desires before they take shape in my mind. What more can I expect to get during the lifetime of King Charles? He gives me everything except only his crown, and the crown, but that he paused and then, after a sigh, said, and the crown is rightly meant to be worn by a person who is worthier than myself, because when my father ceases from his labors and rests in death thus adding to the number of people who have already died and been received in heaven, his legitimate son shall ascend the throne and, if he has no legitimate son, his brother James who is the lawful heir, being the son of the same father, will do so. His brother, though he is oppressed by the ill will of the common people remains firm. He is quite secure in his right to succeed to the throne, and he possesses every virtue that a person of royal blood is expected to possess. All the bravest and best people love him dearly. His courage is recognized even by his enemies. His integrity is proclaimed by his friends. His loyalty is recognized by the king. His fame has spread over the whole world. His merciful nature will be recognized even by the offending common people, because he surely belongs to the category of forgiving people. Why should I then feel sad over the divine will which gives me no excuse to claim the throne? Yet I do wish that fate had been favorably inclined towards me and had raised my status to that of a legitimate child of the king or had given me a vulgar mind, without any spark of ambition in it. It is a pity that fate endowed my generation soul with all the fine qualities only to damn me with the stigma of illegitimacy. I find that my bold spirit is now rising. I, who am the image of my mother, am not owned by King Charles as a legitimate son. Why should my legitimate birth diminish my importance? My soul refuses to admit that there is any relationship between it and the common earthly people. 
my soul, which is made to rule an empire, tells me inwardly in a whisper that, even if the desire to attain greatness is a sin, this sin has a divine character. You are watching the paraphrase of Absalom and a Chit Soful by John Dryden. Filmed by Ohida Chad, Assistant Professor of English and Director, Language Center, University of Information Technology and Sciences. A Chit Soful. Wicked Agent of the Devil. Found him wavering. Loyalty diminishing. Unable to maintain its strength. A Chit Soful replies the following The everlasting God, the possessor of infinite goodness and wisdom, does not bestow such marvelous gifts, as you possess, on anybody without a definite purpose. Who knows what wonderful benefits will accrue to the people during your reign if you become their monarch? Your arguments have proved, though it was not your intention to prove, that goodness and nobility which you possess are given to a man only to enable him to rule a nation. It is not that I condemn your father's gentleness. What I maintain is that a manly strength goes well with the status of a king. It is true that Charles grants all the wishes and desires of the people. And perhaps he grants them more than they ought to get, because too much generosity from a king makes the people think that he is submissive. Such generosity creates among the people an impressive of a king's goodness rather than of his wisdom. But the most appropriate time for the people to try to shake off the restraints imposed upon them by a king is when a king is found to be either negligent in the performance of his duties or if he is found to be weak. Let Charles go on being as generous towards the people as he wants till he comes to the end of his resources. The parliament, which is not so liberal, shall not permit this generosity and will therefore curtail his means. And every penny that receives by the authority of the parliament will mean the loss of some part of his royal authority. It shall be my concern to trouble him by hatching new conspiracies against him or to make him get deeply involved in some costly war the expenses of which he will not be able to pay for long from the royal treasury and to meet which he will have to bargain away whatever of royal authority is left with him. On account of our jealousies and fears of the king, we describe his loyal supporters as Roman Catholics and as being in the pay of the French king. When, in our age, we snap the bonds between him and those supporters by putting an end to his patronage of them, he shall be left alone to face the scorn of the people. I fear and hate the man who stands next in succession to the throne. By my cunning I have made him hateful in the eyes of the people. I have made use of his very virtue to bring about his overthrow and prevailed upon members of the parliament to proclaim him as an enemy of the nation and therefore not entitled to the throne. His right of succession will first be mortgaged by Charles for the money which the king needs badly and then altogether bargained away for the same reason. In this way, King Charles, who is always in need of money, will in due course be forced to accept your doubtful claim to the throne and to proclaim it as being lawful and valid. If he does not do so, the people themselves have the supreme right to appoint their king, because kings are meant to serve the interests of the people. All imperial authority vests with the king as a trust only, or, a king is no more than a trustee holding royal authority on behalf of the people, and when a king begins to exercise that authority as a personal right it can no longer be regarded as legal. The law of succession is intended to ensure the interest of the people in general. If this law makes it possible for a wrong to be committed, the nation is not bound to abide by it. In order to save the people from an injustice, that law can be changed because it is better that one man a legal claimant to the throne, should suffer than that the whole nation should feel the baneful effects of the enforcement of that law. The English Protestants are well aware of their power. Before they chose Cromwell as their leader, they looked upon their king as their god, and they had the courage to remove God, or the king, from the throne. The national interest, the universal demand of the people to which even God yielded, when Charles I was removed from the throne, justifies everything nor should you allow your generous mind to fall under the spell of your father's love for you. A father's love for his son is nothing but a device by which nature brings about the breeding of children and the continuance of the human race. In producing us, our foolish, or loving, fathers, who wanted to attain a kind of immortality, have provided evidence of the fact that their love for us is nothing but an egoistic love of themselves, because in the children that they produce they only see their own image. Either let the king's love for you be judged by its results, in raising you to the position of the heir to the throne, or let him no longer pretend that he loves you. God said that he loved your father, Charles II, and he gave the best possible proof of that love by having him crowned as the king of England. By making him the leader or ruler of such a beautiful country as England, God proved that he loved Charles truly. If Charles wanted that you should be regarded as his beloved son, why did he proclaim somebody else as his heir thus debarring you from becoming the king after him? Charles may feel ashamed to claim that he is devoted to God, but it is God's own desire that he should deprive his legal heir, that is, 
his brother, James, of the right to the throne. The king has handed over the supreme power to his brother James, while to you he has merely given the ownership of a piece of barren land, that is, the landed property which he has settled upon you. He would perhaps also give you the old harp on which he plays the tunes of his songs, or he might compose a dull English poem in praise of you. The heir to the throne, James, is a prince who is wise and harsh of temper. He has already become jealous of you. He can see through the thin mask behind which you try to hide your schemes and devices, and he observes your growing popularity with the people. Although his powerful mind can now keep his dismay, born of jealousy, under control, it is clear that he is planning some action against you because the man who does not express his grievances surely contemplates taking revenge. Such a man is like a lion who sleeps or who pretends to be sleeping and who is waiting for his victim. This lion allows his bold enemies to come near, he refrains from roaring and from spreading his paws till at length the time comes for him to give vent to his rage and to make a sudden leap from the ground in order to attack the enemy. Such a man, like a lion, takes no notice of, and ignores, the ordinary and low creatures who lie prostrate with fear. But he pounces, in a state of royal fury, upon the enemies who were after him, and destroys them. You are in a position which does not permit you to resort to feeble devices. You have to make up your mind either to perish or to conquer by the sword which you must draw because what is at stake is your life, or, because your very life is now threatened, and self-defense is the most ancient law of nature. The people are now in a state of excitement. Do not give them any time to pause and think over the situation, because, if you delay action, your move may then be regarded as an act of treason. Make use of the opportunity that now offers itself, and try to establish your right to the throne while your father is still alive and, in order that your armed action may have a seeming justification, you should declare that you are acting to defend the sacred life of the king which is each minute exposed to danger from plots being hatched by treacherous friends and by secret enemies. And who can read the deepest wishes of King Charles's heart? Perhaps his love for you may prove to be stronger than his fear of his brother. Although he loves you, he is afraid of his brother, and he finds it too late to undo the effect of the pledge that he has already given to make him king. If that is so, he would like to be defeated by force like lustful women who, while inwardly welcoming the opportunity for the satisfaction of their lust, pretend that force had been used against them. Be sure that, when he appears to be angry and annoyed, your action in usurping the throne and gaining it by force would be welcome to him. In order to make a success of your cause, take the king in your custody because those, who hold the ruler in their hands, can do whatever they like with the laws. The advice was most acceptable to the mild nature of Absalom. Very few people can resist the temptation of trying to attain greatness. Some leaders were members of the royal family itself. Duke of Buckingham was the foremost among them. A man of much variety like a summed up all humankind. Rigid in holding opinions, always wrong. Short roll, no repetition, dresses of Indian actresses. Within a month, alchemist slash fiddler slash statesman slash clown. Then wholehearted interest in women slash painting slash writing verses, drinking. Conceived numerous tricks, sports. Disillusioned immediately. Happy madman. Condemned, praised, man of sound judgment, extremist. So excessively condemnation, commendatory, God, devil, human, man's best, worst. Recklessly wasting money. Reduced to poverty by fools. Ridiculed these fools, enjoyed that fun while robbed of wealth, property. Expelled from the royal court because of his folly. Wicked not in action but in intention only, a boy rather than a girl. Formed a party, never elected leader. Unable to leave the party but ousted from the party, conspiring against the king. Tiresome to give a list of the names, titles, worked against the king. Slingby Bethel. Worse than the Duke of Buckingham. Wretched fellow to curse the divinely appointed King Charles II. Early youth, worshipped God, hated the king. Indulges no sins requiring so much money, vising bars by migrated expatriates from Bangladesh. Never violated the sanctity of Sabbath, Sunday, only when earned money, friend never appears in stormy weather. Oath, curse only to denounce the government. Accumulated wealth by the easiest method namely by cheating, showing piety. Shrunken eyes. Loud, jarring voice. Signs of neither ill-tempered nor pride. Long chin, showing his wit. Muddy complexion of a parson. 
face like Moses, sign of sanctity, saintly grace. Prodigious memory. Some accounts made, by flights of pure infancy. Seemed he spoke under the influence of a divine inspiration. Only God knows, how got inspiration, how got the doctor of divinity from the University of Salamanca, a bogus degree. Only the enemies of England considered his divine inspiration to be fake, his pronouncements false. Death sentence for accusing a divinely inspired man of falsehood because depriving of his source of livelihood is tantamount to killing. Ardent religious zeal, to claim a certain license for falsehood, misdeed. Contrived Sir Edmund's murder. Supporting witnesses meet his fate in the same way. Absalom. Surrounding friends misled Absalom into learning the royal court. Felt impatient about his high hopes. People surprised, dazzled to see his handsome personality and gazed with eagerness, joy. Spoke only a few words but in natural tones suitable for the occasion. Words flowed more slowly than drops of honey. As follows. My countrymen. I feel sorry for the loss of prestige and privilege that you have suffered, thought I have been absolutely unable to prevent your evil fate. Look at me, a banished man, subjected to welfare. Yet it is my wish that I alone had been the victim of the king's injustice. I would not mind being deprived of my claim as the heir to the throne or being disowned as a son by the king. But the pity is that you too have suffered. You have been deprived of all your liberties. France and Holland have usurped your trade, and Roman Catholics make it impossible for you to observe your sacred religious ceremonies. My father, whose name even now I mention with the deepest respect, seems to have fallen under some spell and is leading a life of ease, regardless of his reputation. He is bribed with petty sums of foreign money and he has grown old in the embraces of his mistress, the Duchess of Portsmouth. He is raising his enemies to high positions. He is ruining his friends, and in this way he is using all his authority against his own interests. He is distributing favors, and I do not mind if he gives away my right to somebody else. But he has no business to the nation suffer, and he is the only one whom I will not try to punish for his crimes against the nation. Under the circumstances, all that I can give you is my tears of sympathy. And saying this he wiped his eyes. These tears are the only help which, with my present resources, I can offer you. These tears are like harmless weapons to which no court spy can object. Such innocent weapons can justly be used by sons against their fathers. It is my wish that when an est claimant to the throne becomes the King of England, no Englishman should have any reason to complain. Youth slash beauty slash graceful action seldom fails to produce an effect. Greatest hospitality shown by Thomas the wealthy friend, western part of England. Given out that Queen, his brother, Duke of York, hatched conspiracy against King Charles II. Even the king's perfect are likely to be condemned by the mob as being sinful slash cruel slash tyrannical. If people regarded the judges of right, fair. If kings merely trustees of the people's rights. People are forever excluded from the right to reassert their authority. These originally entrusted the duties and powers of kingship to an incumbent. Also to bind their descendants to their deed. The cause is similar to that of Adam. Adam committed a fault leading to the expulsion from the Garden of Eden. All mankind to suffer the penalties imposed on Adam by God for Adam's disobedience. Divine punishment for his sin, even though not consented. Even perfect kings likely to be condemned by the mob as being sinful slash cruel slash tyrannical. Dash the mob, the higher the tide, the more rapid is the fall of water at the ebb. King's supporters on the top of this short list. Duke of Ormond. One honours. A man of ripe age. Earl of Ossory. Had the ancient sense of honour. Remain unconquered in battle. England deserved such a man of rare qualities. Men of excessive fame have short lives. As if heaven had planned to ruin the English nation and could not allow his calibre to rescue his country. His soul freed from earthly toils and soared upwards beyond the clouds and the starry regions. Soul might bring a huge number of similar souls to protect King Charles. Dryden wishes his own soul departed to a company. William Sancroft. Archbishop of Canterbury. Avoided power and position because of his modesty and won Charles' favour by his humility. Henry Compton. Bishop of London. Came of a noble stock and hospitable manner. John Dolben. Dean of Westminster. Weighty ideas, a preacher of heavenly eloquence. Other supporters, 
advocates negation judges, loyal peers. Earl of Mulgrave. A man of keen, penetrating judgment. A patron of poets, of letters and himself a poet. George Saville. Marquis of Halifax. A man of piercing wit and fertile thinking. Gifted by nature and taught by learning to influence and sway audiences. Lawrence Hyde. Earl of Rochester, Charles Friend. Edward Seymour. Speaker of the House of Commons from 1673 to 1679. King Charles II. Weighed down by the burden of all these wrongs. Patience exhausted and inspired by heaven. Godlike king spoke from his royal throne. Followers, in a state of awe and fear, heard a voice. Influenced by my inborn merciful nature I have for a long time been overlooking the wrongs done to me and have been postponing my revenge upon the wrongdoers. I have willingly been forgiving those who gave me offence, allowing my fatherly feelings for the wrongdoers to soften my anger as the king, but now my opponents hold my forgiveness so much in contempt that the very culprits question my authority to pardon them. They hotly argue that one man was made the king for the benefit of the many, people, but they do not realize that the function of a king is to rule over the people. They misinterpret my mild disposition as fear, and they forget that a man who is brave by temperament can endure wrongs for the longest time. Yet, now that they are bent upon diverting me from the course which I, under the influence of my nature, have been adopting, the time has come to prove that I am not good to them under any compulsion. The insults which the arrogant subjects heap upon a king are a fit burden for a camel to carry, but no king will tolerate them. Kings are like the pillars of the state, and they are born to bear and support the nation's weight for, they are born to shoulder and carry out the responsibility of administering the state. If my young son, the Duke of Monmouth, pretends that, like the brave Samson, he has been urged by heaven to shake the pillar of the state, let him then get ready to be crushed under the pillar which he will bring down. But it is my wish that he should repent to his folly and thus escape death. Parents find it very easy to pardon their erring children. An erring son has only to shed a few tears of repentance, and it seems to the parents that nature itself is pleading the case of their darling son whom the parents then gladly forgive. My poor Monmouth is to be pitied at his wretched condition. Under my paternal care he was raised to the highest position of which he could carry the burden. Had it been God's will that he should rule an empire, God would have given his soul a different shape, or, God would have ensured a legitimate birth for him. He has been fooled by the people who have given him the nature of a patriot. The common or vulgar meaning of the word patriot is one who feels justified by law to depose his king. A patriot is willing to act as a hired assassin at the bidding of the people, and to be used as a tool by the politicians. Anyone who has ever called himself a patriot was actually a fool. What is the origin of the view that religion and the laws are more my son's concern than my own? The old Earl of Shaftesbury, who is instigating the Duke of Monmouth, was never thought to be endowed with so much grace before I dismissed him from his high position, as now. It is surprising how a political group of people can depict such a man as a patriot. The man who rebels against the king is always worshipped by the people as their saint. Do my opponents in Parliament wish to thrust an heir upon the throne? Let me then teach Parliament that they can give only what is theirs to give. At the very least a king is a part of the government, and my consent, to their proposal, is therefore as necessary as theirs. If they claim the right to choose their next king without my consent, it means that they have also the right to remove the present king. It is true that they have prayed to me to approve their choice, of the next king, but this is sheer hypocrisy like that practiced by Jacob who deceived his blind father by wearing goat skin on his hands and making him think that it was Esau, his hairy brother. It is strange that my subjects, who believe themselves to be pious, pray for my safety and, in order to ensure my safety, try to take my royal power away from me. My heaven protect my old age against plots and treacherous conspiracies, but I need an even greater protection against those who pretend to be my petitioners and who always remain unsatisfied like the barren womb or the grave. God can never grant them as much as they desire, or, their desires are unlimited and they can never be satisfied no matter how much God gives them. What then is left for me except to exercise vigilance and to protect what little yet remains with me of royal authority? I shall still follow the law in peacefully ruling the country, and I shall teach my opponents to obey the same law. Members of parliament should no more be allowed to control the established authority of the king by a majority of votes, because it cannot be decided by voting that a part is greater than the whole, or, that the people should be more powerful than their king. I shall not remove my supporters from their high positions just because there are noisy and baseless demands for their removal. 
nor shall I allow mobs to have the power to punish without proving that punishment is deserved. Gods, and kings who derive their authority from gods, are anxious to defend their faithful followers in distress. I wish that there were limits to my power of pardon. Why should I be compelled, like God, to inflict, against my will, exemplary punishment my opponents? To enforce the law is a necessary duty for me, and its enforcement inevitably leads to certain evil consequences for the wrongdoers. How mistaken my enemies are in interpreting my forgiveness as fear. When a patient man's limit of endurance is reached, his fury knows no bounds. My enemies demand the enforcement of the law, let them then see the true face of the law. They have not felt satisfied with the rear view of the law, when consisted in my mercy towards them. They have been reckless enough to demand to see the front view of the law. Let them see the front view and meet their destruction because the front view means justice which is terrible and relentless. Rightly has it been decreed that these people, who plot the death of others by their grim maneuvers, shall die as a result of their own stratagems. The witnesses they produce to support their allegations will give evidence on oath against these very men and will bring about their destruction just as young vipers tear the womb of their mother and nourish themselves by sucking the very blood which was the source of life for them. The evildoers will fight against their own wicked leader and, in this way, my enemies will do me good by destroying one another. Nor need I doubt the outcome of the contest between me and my enemies, because mobs which oppose a ruler spend all their brutal fury in their very first onslaught. Let them then wage war against me without any resistance from me. Let them attack, withdraw, and form a mistaken view of their force. I shall challenge them to a fight when they are exhausted and spent up, and shall, overwhelm them with my superior power. Lawful power always shows its superiority when, having long been pushed back, it at last makes a stand and fights determinedly against the enemy. This is what the king said. God Almighty nodded and gave his consent to the king's strategy. Peals of thunder shook the sky in token of God's approval. From that time onwards a new chapter in English history began. Many years of royal supremacy followed one another. Once more the divine power of King Charles was established and recognized, and willing nations humbly submitted to the authority of their lawful monarch. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my channel.